Recovered Voices is an attempt to bring into the repertory much music that was lost due to the Nazi suppression. The term was coined at Los Angeles Opera when we started doing operas by some of these composers. And the term belongs to them, and we use it here at the Colburn School in Los Angeles or with their permission. And the purpose of Recovered Voices is to promote performance of these many works by dozens of composers that have been ignored. And so we concentrate on that here at the Colburn School uh, in encouraging performance and in encouraging the public to take an interest and to familiarize themselves with a lot of that music. I'm often asked if this was music that was written in concentration camps and if that is its focus. And the answer is no, and perhaps 2% at a liberal estimate of this music, of this music was actually written in a concentration camp. There are some notable exceptions to that, but they are few, and little is left behind from the concentration camps. This is not about that. This is restoring to the repertory, or bringing to the repertory for the first time, music that was written anywhere from 1945 back to the end of the 19th century, which was banned by the Nazis and which laid fallow for a very long time. Some of it has still not been brought back. And at a certain moment, there's a, a sort of an epiphany. The moment when you realize that all of these composers have remained neglected to one degree or another because of a non-artistic factor. There was nothing artistic in the judgment of the Nazis whose music was to be banned and whose not. It was completely political, racial, and genocidal. The importance of history cannot be underestimated. And this music has been ignored in the recounting of the 20th century. Music history has been written for the 20th century with the omission of many of these names, and certainly of the significance of their various musical styles. And until that's corrected, uh, I don't think we have a proper vision. And I think in today's world, we are particularly keen, again, revisiting the past and understanding what we may have gotten wrong, what has been passed on as true, untrue, not quite true, omissions, inaccuracies. I think that we need, as a classical music community, to dig deeper into the 20th century and to bring out this group of composers and the music and to understand why we don't know them, which was, of course, political and racist suppression. And it is horrifying to realize that the damage that has been done, was done in the 12, 13 years of the Nazi regime has taken decades and decades to correct. But destruction is easy and quick, and reconstruction is slow and perhaps laborious. But it is very important that we restore to civilization what belongs to our civilization. Erwin Schulhoff is a particularly interesting composer and man. He was uh, an avant-gardist back in the time already just after the First World War. He went on to go through several uh, metamorphoses of, of his style, including, and most importantly, jazz, because this was something that was very important to him. And in his later years, he became a, a convinced Marxist, as did many young intellectuals in Europe, and that informed his music in the later period. Now, this extraordinarily creative individual's life came to an end in a concentration camp in 1942 in Bavaria, cutting short one of the most productive minds that comes out of this period.
Thank you so much for being here. My name is Dominic Cayley, and it's a real honor to celebrate the release of Shapeshifter, the music of Erwin Schulhoff today. And uh, there's a lot of different music you're going to hear. The first piece, Susie, is quite literally jazz. This is Schulhoff at the end of his life, one of the last pieces he ever wrote, 1937, writing um, music that is a foxtrot, kind of hailing back to the golden 20s and to a happier time of his life. At this point, Susie, one of these numbers that you, you hear and you think you've heard in a past life perhaps, in a dream perhaps, this beautiful piece was not even, he couldn't even publish it under his own name. He had to use a pseudonym, because at the time, this is when the Nazis were in full force and he was not able to publish or perform publicly in, in Germany. So uh, it's truly one of his, uh, his, his swan songs, one of the most beautiful things that he wrote, and i um, so happy that I could share that with you. Uh, we're coming up on two other excerpts. Uh, these are earlier works. This is about 1926 now, and these are pieces for the left hand alone. So uh, it just says left hand in your program, I know, but in the, in the score it's specified alone. And that's important because this was a music that was dedicated to a, a fellow uh, Czech named Atakar Halman. So in World War I, Schulhoff and Mr. Halman, they, they fought together on multiple fronts, the, the Russian front, the Italian front. They um, were prisoners of, prison, prisoners of war, POWs, and they really went through so many trials and tribulations. And unfortunately, Atakar um, lost the use of his right hand during World War I. And as a result, Schulhoff, in his intense generosity and kindness of spirit, wrote a piece that could bring um, Atakar, his dear friend, back into the musical fold. And so that aside is something very fascinating and, and unique. On top of that, we see influences of other composers at play here. So, in Schulhoff's early years, he studied with a composer many of you might know, Claude Debussy. Uh, the two of them really did not get along. They only had two lessons, the first and the last, uh, because <clears throat> Debussy, who was a radical composer and, and artist, um, it was very conservative in his teaching. And Schulhoff uh, wanted to write specifically parallel fifths. And that's a no-no in, in musical uh, compositional style of, a, of, the, of the old style. So uh, they did not get along, Schulhoff left, but um, this impressionism of this French impressionism made a huge impact on Schulhoff. And this preludio that you're gonna hear first, it's like watercolor being painted across the piano. The Zingara, the next uh, third movement, is a sort of country folk type of dance, but it has a la Zingala. It's a bit more rustic, it's edgy. There's lots of elbows flying in this dance, so it's not very elegant. Uh, needless to say, though, you'll hear lots of different instruments, drums, cymbals, probably some flutes and maybe kazoos or something, as Schulhoff explores the true uh, bounds of the piano, and I don't, for one second, miss my right hand. So I hope that you enjoy the left hand suite.
Hello, everyone. Is this thing on? I think it is. Uh, my name is Adam Milstein, and I'm currently getting my artist diploma here at the Colburn School, but I'm also the program manager of the Zeering Conlin Initiative for Recovered Voices. And I'm so happy that all of you are here today, and I'm just so excited to be on stage with my dear friend and colleague, Dominic, celebrating the Shapeshifter album release. Um, Ervin Schulhoff is a composer that I hold very near and dear to my heart. Um, I actually first encountered his music in the early days of the pandemic as I was kind of researching different recovered voices composers and I came across Schulhoff and forgive the pun but it struck a real chord with me because I was just enraptured by all his wide variety of masterful compositional styles. Um, and this album release actually comes at a very interesting time in my own life personally with my relationship with not only Schulhoff but also his life. Um, a couple weeks ago, this past summer, I was performing some of his chamber music at the Accademia Chigiana in Italy. Um, and following my time there and performing his music in Tuscany, I decided to go to Prague, his birthplace, to do my own sort of research into Schulhoff, where he was from, his roots. And I actually went, looked into the Czech National Museum of Music and I sent them a cold email and I was like, would you mind if I come check out your estate of Schulhoff? They said, please come in. I said, thank you. I went. I got their catalog and I they said, check out whatever you want. So I took 17 manuscripts out, and I thought that was okay. And they said, oh my goodness, we should only give five manuscripts, but in your case, we'll make an exception. So they were super cool, and they let me have access to 17 original manuscripts of Schulhoff. So it still gives me goosebumps thinking about holding his manuscripts in my hands that he touched. And I was able to actually take photocopies of them, and I have them to this day now for reference and research. Um, following my time in Prague, I decided to research more Recovered Voices composers, and I went on a little odyssey by myself um, via train from Prague to Vienna to Salzburg to Munich to Würzburg to Nuremberg and to Berlin, where I researched all of these Recovered Voices composers, and I went to multiple concentration camps and other centers and archives. Um, and one of my last stops was in Würzburg, Bavaria, where Schulhoff died of tuberculosis. This was a prisoner of war camp. Um, in, in outside of, of, of Munich, uh, outside of Nuremberg, and there's a little monument that is built to him there, and I actually went and found his gravesite as well, where he was buried among other Russian prisoners of war who were slave laborers there. And Schulhoff's own son actually buried him there. Uh, his son survived the war to become a very prominent Czech filmmaker in the new wave scene, but it was a very emotional experience being there, um, places where he lived and flourished and loved and made music and to where he met his end. Um, and tonight we're going to play for you uh, the second movement of his uh, violin sonata written in 1927. Um, and this is a very intense and sort of dark piece, but ultimately very beautiful, I think. Um, there's a very interesting drone that happens in Dominic's left hand that is very constant, and the violin sort of serves as some form of almost incantation that happens over it, and there's angst and there's agita, and I believe that there's some form of conflict that exists, um, to which I will leave it up to the audience to decide what that may be, what sort of inner turmoil Schulhoff is facing in 1920s. Um, but without further ado, we hope you enjoy the second movement of his violin sonata. Thank you.
So the next piece that we're going to play some excerpts from is the piano concerto. And well, we don't have an orchestra, so you might be wondering why Adam's still up here and why we're doing this at all. We want to show you two things. We want to show you the opening few minutes of the concerto from this really amazing recording project that we did with Maestro Conlin and the RVC Ensemble uh, last year. Um, and then we're going to play live following that. We're going to play a little excerpt. And this is an interesting work because uh, there's a lot of misnomers in this piece. It's a piano concerto, and yes, the piano's featured, but there's also uh, lots of violin solos. In addition, it's called P Concerto for Piano and Small Orchestra, but this is probably one of the largest orchestras you will see uh, on a stage uh, if you see it live, which hopefully will happen at some point. But this piece, again, reflects lots of different aspects of, of Shulhoff's character. The opening is kind of similar to that preludio that we heard, which is a lot of watercolor, mysteriousness. You definitely see Ravel being inspired by this opening. Ravel would write his piano concerto a few years after. And we get to this really iconic moment called Alla Zingara, which is, again, a solo for the concertmaster. And as a pianist, uh, we have our own cadenzas, but it's really special to be able to share the spotlight with a good friend, Adam. So Adam, what's it like to play uh, this huge solo in a piano concerto? Well, I wish it happened more often that we get big solos in piano concertos, first and foremost. Um, but this piece, again, is so interesting uh, in terms of Schulhoff and this notion of the shapeshifter who has all these dynamic styles of writing and even contained within this piano concerto. I mean, he was in his peak Dada era. and He wrote, as Dominic said, for chamber orchestra, which is an ironic title because it uses more percussion instruments than maybe anything. Um, and the last movement that we're going to play an excerpt from is this crazy jazz movement that happens and all of a sudden it's interrupted by this very intimate moment between concertmaster and solo pianist. And we wanted to show you a little excerpt of what the recording process looked like. So we're going to show that in a second. And you're going to note this happened sort of pre-vaccine pandemic and we made it work very socially distanced. Um, everyone was masked and we actually had to, well, I didn't personally do it, but the wonderful engineering and producing team had to mix all the percussion instruments that were recorded separately onto the track later on. So it was a very much a feat of recording magic that happened. So without further ado, we're gonna show you a little bit of the clip and then we're gonna kind of take off from where the clip leaves us. So yes, we hope you enjoy.
in classical music training, you know, we're taught the classics, we're taught Mozart, Beethoven, Mahler, Strauss, you know, and even in our education, you know, a lot of it is the same kind of composers. And so when we come across composers like Schulhoff, people that are often forgotten in history, um, it brings a new kind of exciting thing to work on because we're so used to listening to the classic Beethoven five, you know, Mahler, Mahler nine, you know, um, to be able to perform and to work on something else is just an incredible opportunity. I was fascinated when I first played the, the string quartet back in uh, 2019. Um, I had heard uh, four of my other classmates and other string quartet play it the year before. And when I first heard, I was like, wow, that is so, so, so unique and exciting. I was, I couldn't believe how how sucked in I was into that performance. Um, and I knew that I really wanted to play that piece. I think that this project in particular is fantastic because the more people that we share this music with, the better. And hopefully it inspires other quartets and other musicians to look into his music and program it more often. A composer who showed such extraordinary sense of life. I can't say optimism. He wasn't an optimist but he was somebody who confronted life with all of its ironies and difficulties with tremendous energy, accepting the challenge of life, accepting to fight with uh, melancholy and depression, accepting to fight to make his living. He did all of those things and he transformed that at first into music of, uh, with a very life-affirming vein, which gradually changed color, as we've seen in the 1930s and into the early 40s. Uh, but he was alive, very much alive, the whole time. And his music reflects all of those variegated twists and turns. He went through all of his styles, not because he was eclectic, no, because he could see the link between this style, that style, this combination, that kind of, he could see, he could see connections that others didn't necessarily see. And he was brave enough to follow those connections that he saw. And so his output is enormously fascinating. Just a very quick word about this piece. Um, this is from the five pieces for string quartet, which is a piece that Golly and I have played a lot. We've recorded it. Nathan and I have played it a lot. Jing and I have yet to play it, but this is our first time doing it, so it should be pretty fun. Um, and it's a really interesting piece by Schulhoff, again, written in his peak Dada phase where he was doing a lot of absurd musical things. These are a collection of five dances. They're like little vignettes. Um, the first one is a waltz that's supposed to be in a 3-4, but he writes it in a 2-4, which no one would know unless you were looking at the score. Um, the second movement is a very beautiful, weird, creepy serenade. The third movement is a Czech movement. And the fourth and fifth, which you're here right now, are very fascinating pieces. The fourth is a tango milonga, which is a little faster than your normal tango, but still very sensual and cool and smoky and fun. Um, and then the fifth movement is a tarantella, uh, which we have a lot of fun playing, and it's very rambunctious and so much life and energy, and we really hope you enjoy the fourth and fifth pieces from the five pieces for string quartet.
Hello. Well, it's great to be back on stage again, and I would like to make a special and warm welcome to Mark Abel, who is the uh, co-director of Delos and also a wonderful composer who Dominic and I have actually had the privilege of also um, recording some of Mark's pieces too, so maybe that'll be the next concert we can my, do. My privilege. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, just uh, before we start this, this brief um, sort of chat with the artists, uh, I want to just say a few thank yous um, to everyone that made this possible, uh, to Marilyn Ziering and to many other members here of the Colburn community. Many of you are here tonight, and without you, this project would not be possible. Um, I would also like to thank uh, for the work and support of, of James Conlin, Jennifer Calland, Michelle Yamamoto, Nick Janopoulos, and Robert Elias. Um, to the designers, Philip Parolo and Lonnie Kunkel. Um, and a big thank you to the wonderful Colburn audio visual team who not only made this album happen, but also this evening possible. So to producers, Fred Vogler and Jeremy Frank, engineers, Francesco Perlangeli, um, Sergei Parfenov and Derek Williams. And also very importantly, um, to Rebecca Stewart, who is not here this evening because she's in Europe, um, but she's the wonderful scholar who actually wrote the amazing liner notes. So I highly encourage you to not only buy the album, but also read the liner notes because they're really great and Rebecca um, did all of them. So um, I wanted to start off um, this evening actually chatting a bit to Mark. Um, when I first met Mark, it was actually through Dominic and it was a really wonderful experience because he's one of the rare individuals and we're hoping to change this, but one of the rare individuals where he already not only knew who Ervin Shulhoff was, but was a big supporter and advocate of Shulhoff. So it's really cool to be able to geek out with someone about Shulhoff. Um, and that's what we did from the get-go. Um, and I just wanted to, to ask you, Mark, so when did you first become aware of Shulhoff and how did you? Uh, well, the emergence of Shulhoff um, in the latter part of the 20th century started really, in, in my opinion, with a series of recordings that the venerable Czech label Superphone did from 1993 to 1996. I think there are 10 of them in all. Um, I have seven of them, I think. And this put quite a, uh, uh, a wide spectrum and look at what Schulhoff had done, recorded by the best uh, Czech um, instruments, uh, players they could find. and. Uh, I happened to hear one of these recordings um, on the radio in San Francisco. Uh, the pieces that were being played were Schulhoff's string sextet um, and a duo for violin and cello, which are both uh, tour de force uh, wonderful pieces. And uh, <coughs> I was so struck with them that I eventually, uh, well not eventually, but rather quickly, uh, I bought some of these records and didn't know a soul who had ever heard of him, but he had convinced me uh, right off the bat. And then in, I think in 1999, um, uh, summer vacation in New Hampshire. I don't, don't know how this all fits together, but somebody told me about the recording of Schulhoff's only opera, which is called Flamen, uh, Flames, uh, which was done um, in the uh, Deutsche Grammophon and Tartete music uh, series. Uh, <coughs> and uh, the opera is an, just an amazing display of uh, Schulhoff's um, orchestral virtuosity there's more orchestral music in it than there actually is singing. And uh, you know, you just have to, it's, it's an awesome piece. It's only been recorded one more, one time since then. The Deutsche Grammophon recording was in 1995. And um, it's a piece uh, that should be heard more. And so ever, ever since then, I've accepted it for myself that he was an important composer and um, when I found out that Dominic and Adam were seriously, and Galia were, were seriously delving into this stuff, um, it made me so happy. I, I had, hadn't known Dominic for that long, but the two of them invited me down here um, about a year and a month ago to, on, on this very stage and <laughs> played me some of the pieces that you've just heard. And it was really one of uh, the most wonderful experiences I've had <coughs> as, a, as a consumer of music. I was just sitting out there somewhere. I was the only person in the hall besides them. And when I heard, I had never heard the violin sonata before, they were already working on this uh, series of videos that they've done. And uh, Maestro Conlon had already done some of his lectures. But uh, the first thing I could think of was that um, my, the label that I record for and also work for uh, had to offer the opportunity uh, to have these performances released and uh, it took a little while but I'm so glad that it has because I think that 
young American musicians need to wrap their uh, brains around this music. Uh, there's much more consciousness of Schulhoff in Europe than there is from here. Uh, but, you know, if, if you don't check him out, you're really missing something. I have to definitely second everything you just said. And I'm so curious about, so the title, Shapeshifter, do you want to talk about that a little bit? And you're thinking well, we were, um, I went back and forth uh, with uh, Jennifer Calland uh, quite a bit about how we were going to put th this uh, release together. And I think it just, it, it, it just kind of came up spontaneously for me. His uh, stylistic um, periods and the shifts and the amount of terrain that he covered um, just suggested this term shapeshifter, which has um, uh, come into uh, usage a lot in the last 20 years. But here's somebody who really was a shapeshifter in a certain sense, and uh, they, they liked it, so we went with that as a title. Yeah, I think it's a great title. And also, I just want to draw everyone's attention to the really cool art um, that's here. It was actually made by one of Schulhoff's friends um, back in the 20s, and it's in a, a wood block, and uh, it's su such a really striking image. So anyway, it's something else I just wanted to bring a little attention to. Um, and, and Dominic, I wanted to talk a little bit to you about Schulhoff. You played a lot of his music. Um, this past year in particular, you were playing him across the country in about a dozen different states at prestigious festivals such as Ravinia, the Gilmore Festival, the Bravo Vale Festival. Where else are you playing Schulhoff this year? So I, I like to program this music everywhere because it resonates so deeply with me from a historical point of view, but also from this incorporation of jazz. Uh, where else am I playing it? Well, most notably in January of this upcoming 2023, I'm playing it at Carnegie Hall, so I'm really excited about that. Um, the Left Hand Suite in particular, actually the two selections that you heard this evening. So those two for me are very striking, and that's why I want to bring it to one of the greatest stages. And you program a lot of Schulhoff now, and how has becoming familiar with his music and his compositional voice sort of influenced your own programming? Are there other composers that you kind of relate him to? Yeah, so as I've really studied Schulhoff, and actually the first piece I ever heard was the piano concerto, um, and as I've listened to pretty much all of his piano music and as much of his chamber music as I could, I started to really realize that he resonates with me and connects really to Beethoven, actually. Um, those two composers, I, I really hold in the same breath because Beethoven, uh, he challenges not just the player, but the listener. And I feel like Schulhoff is very uh, representative of that as well. Uh, Schulhoff is writing music that uh, was really breaking ground in, in swift ways at his time. Uh, he was both in his, he was back in the, in the past, he was in his present and in the future, the type of music he was writing. And on top of that, uh, this jazzy style that he writes, it's not imitative, it's actually really true jazz. And uh, my father was a, a jazz musician, a professional one, so I remember playing the music of Schulhoff one day, and he said, oh, what, are you, what are you playing jazz piano for? I'm like, this is, this is Schulhoff, this is not, um, I'm not, I'm not improvising, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, but actually, the improvisation is a very important aspect of Schulhoff, because he was one of the greatest improvisers of the early 20th century. And uh, Beethoven is also known as one of the great improvisers. And I'm really excited that Adam brought to my attention some fascinating improvisations, written out cadenzas of Schulhoff for Beethoven's piano concertos. So um, that's my next uh, real fascination of engraving this, these handwritten scores and, and playing this, this music because, uh, again, the two of them, I see so many similarities. Yeah, those, um, those Beethoven cadenzas, they were published a while ago and they're totally out of print now. And I came across them when I was, when I was in Prague and the first thing I did was I texted Dominic, I was like, oh my God, he wrote uh, cadenzas for the first four of Beethoven concertos and we have to record these because I don't think they've been recorded before and it'd be a really cool thing to hear Schulhoff's take on Beethoven and drawing this comparison even closer together. Um, and Golly, I wanted to chat to you a little bit about Schulhoff. So, as I mentioned earlier, before we did the five pieces for string quartet, Gali is probably the most seasoned Schulhoff quartet musician that I know. Um, you've, you've, how many have you played Schulhoff in how many different groups? Um, I think I started playing, well, the first time I played the Schulhoff, uh, this piece, the five pieces, was uh, for the Recovery Voices competition here at Colburn, which happens every year. And um, I think, I, you know, I don't remember exactly the year, but I think it was 2017 or 2018, and then every single year since then, I have played this piece with completely different people every time. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and we also, um, we played his first quartet um, this summer also in Italy, and we played it in Reno, Nevada at Clive Greensmith's um, Chamber Festival there, where, where it was very well received also. Um, so it's been great playing Schulhoff with Galia just in general. Um, for this particular recording, I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about um, 
I'm sure it was peak pandemic. We recorded the string quartet. We recorded it here um, in Zipper Hall. But do you want to chat about the rehearsal process and how we oh, actually yeah. recorded it and the physicality of it? So this was like, this was when COVID was really bad in LA. This was like, they were telling us, stay at home, don't go outside. Um, and Adam, you know, we, we both were like, we need to play music together. Like we cannot just be sitting in our homes alone and not doing anything right now. And so Adam came up with the idea that we were gonna play and practice in his garage outside. Thanks mom and dad, Thanks, I know they're here somewhere, dad. yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Garage band, the original, yeah. You know, I've lived in LA for like seven years now, but I think I've fully gotten the Chicago skin off of me because it was like, it was January, and it was like maybe 60, 60, 65 degrees at most. There was heaters above all four of us. They were so kind to cut heaters above us. And we were freezing and playing in our jackets, and, but we were still rehearsing and we really wanted to get this done. And then finally the recording day comes and we come in here and I'm over there, Adam's over there, Ben's all the way back. It's just like we recorded 10 feet apart from each other. Um, and if you've played in a string quartet, you know that that is uh, bad news because you need to hear each other and, and at least see each other. Um, so we, we came across that challenge, but we were so determined to get just the best take and the best we could do because we were... We, again, we were sitting in our homes, not doing anything, and this, you know, this project, recording this string quartet is like such a, you know, a, it holds such a wonderful place in my heart because it really, it got me back into, I love music. This is getting me out of the COVID, like, slump. I'm, I'm enjoying this music, and, and this music is just so exciting and just so unique, and as Do everything that Dominic and Adam has said all night, just, it is just, fantastic composer that got lost throughout history. Yeah, And we're trying our best to, to bring it back. And anyway, everyone here, just being here and hearing this music um, is so important because without an audience, uh, there there is no one to listen to it. And Maestro Conlon talks about this. It's like if a tree falls in the forest, it's a similar thing. Without audiences, these composers, it's hard for them and their music to survive and to be continued and to be put into the canon. And that's what we're all so passionate about. So thank you all for being here again. And um, Please buy a record or stream it or do whatever, and we're so excited, and yeah. Can I mention one other thing? Yes, please. Um, I was uh, brushing up on my Schulhof a couple of days ago before coming down here, and I decided that I wanted to listen to his sixth symphony another time, uh, his, his last completed symphony, and it was completed uh, weeks or maybe a month or two before uh, the roof uh, fell in completely for him and the... Uh, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. He kept on writing, on writing right till the end. But um, so I went to YouTube to find the Sixth Symphony, <clears throat> which so far has only been recorded once, and that's in the Superphone series that I mentioned at the beginning. So I listened to it again, and I looked at <clears throat> the one comment that was beneath the performance of the symphony. It was written, I, I'm, this, I'm kind of addressing this now to any younger musicians who happen to be in the audience. Someone named Deborah K. Goodhead, who lives in Oklahoma City, wrote the following. Enjoyed Symphony No. 6, composed by Erwin Schulhoff at the Oklahoma City College Performing Arts Center in Oklahoma City today. The first time it has been performed in North America in honor of the Holocaust. It was performed by the Oklahoma City Philharmonic and Canterbury Voices. This was May 22nd of this year. So it's taken uh, until this year for Schulhoff's Sixth Symphony to be played um, in North America. And younger musicians who are interested in his music, there's so many opportunities to get it out there. There are cities like Oklahoma City or Minneapolis. There's all kinds of heartland cities that, that in a lot of ways are more open to music like this uh, than uh, the big centers. Uh, we, we call them the flyover states. Um, not a very nice thing to say, but I'm, what I'm saying is y you can take this man's music out there if you like it enough and something will happen. Uh, it, it's, its quality is uh, high enough that uh, something's going to give um, and they'll start record, uh, re performing more of his music, which is what has to happen. Thank you so much for that, Mark. That is so true, and I think 
we're a testament to that here on stage of taking his music and what can happen with it. And we're all thrilled with it. And we hope that all the young Colbert musicians here in the audience and anyone listening to the live stream that's a musician out there, please check out Schulhoff and play him and get it out there. And I think cool things will happen. Yeah. Great. Thank you all so much.